Married people, what is something you wish unmarried people knew? Story one, love is a choice. Once you choose to commit to your partner, choose to keep loving them. Choose to respond with love and compassion. Choose to put them first and vice versa. There are definitely exceptions to this, like abuse and cheating, but if you go into marriage with a self-centered focus and telling yourself you can leave if things get hard, then you will. Marriage isn't transactional, where if they don't meet your needs 100%, then you should leave. Marriage really should be a partnership where you're both trying your best and recognizing that what your best is will vary based on your circumstances. A great visualization of this is a garden. Love is the garden. You buy a house with a really great garden. You promise to tend to that garden for all your days. Fast forward a few years, you're busy with work and kids, you've been sick a lot, you're stressed, you sprained your ankle recently, etc. Point is, you have lots of excuses for why you haven't been out to fertilize the garden, reseed the annuals, aerate the soil, water and deweed the beds, treat for pests, etc. You're just too busy, too tired, can't be bothered. Surprise, the garden is looking pretty sad doesn't smell nice anymore, doesn't even look nice. Guess what? On your morning walk, you see some really nice looking and smelling gardens. Should you sell the house and get one with a nicer garden? Sure, why not? You deserve it. You work hard. You only live once. Boom. Cycle of relationship failures has begun. In your wake, you'll leave a trail of ruined gardens. Not because the gardens weren't right for you or weren't good enough, but because you didn't bother to invest in them while still expecting them to be beautiful and produce flowers and fruit for you. Doesn't work that way. Flowers and fruit take work. Water, soil, nutrients, and not least of which, time, energy, and prioritization from each person. If you don't put those things in consistently over time, don't be surprised at the wilted weeds you get in return. Story two. It's a heck of a lot of work, but not hard work. But you have to do it, each and every day. Some people get tired of doing it every day. Some people never wanted to do it every day. Some people make one partner do it all. Sometimes it doesn't work. It only works so long as you wake up and do it every day. There are no days off. To clarify, what do I mean by work? It goes beyond mere division of labor and assets, though that's important as well. It means division of emotional labor of both parties being sure every day to be sensitive to each other, to do tasks without being told, to listen to one another, to work together to solve problems, and to save each other through acute and chronic illness. Over time, almost nine years here, romance and passion does tend to fade. Sometimes it's just getting older. I definitely do not have the same sensual energy now that I did then, husband too. It's not about replacing romance or passion, but making sure that you have a partner, a real steadfast companion who you can lean on, who makes life easier, not harder, who makes life fun, not boring, who makes us feel like we are not alone. Where a lot of folks trip up is that they look for that in a partner, but then don't give the same in return. Marriage is about doing a lot of giving and taking, and that balance gets messed up a lot. Story 3 my husband is big into video games, but I didn't play much before him. He has introduced me to a few that I love. I really enjoy asking him about his games and what he's playing now, and hearing him talk about all the wacky stuff they do and what's fun about it, or not fun about it. And sometimes I hear about a game that sounds fun to me too, and I try it out. I'm a huge sports fan, but he just never was very interested in sports. I introduced him to football and showed him why it's a great nerd sport and a lot of fun to watch. Then later, baseball. Thanks, pandemic. Now we watch sports together and play games side by side a lot. But when we met, we had neither of these things in common. But we have similar thought processes and we like things for similar reasons. So once introduced to the things, we found common ground. Story 4 We got the everything changes after you get married stuff too. But it didn't change for us or our relationship. Instead, how everyone else treated us changed, because we were now a traditionally understood social unit, and that meant everyone could start using stereotypes. Will your wife let you? Old ball and chain? And asking questions that are none of their business. 
When are you finally going to give him a baby? You can't be a family without kids, and just generally acting like life is a sitcom plot with stock situations. Don't you have to go home and fix dinner for your husband? Wait, your husband is fixing dinner? How'd you pussy whip him into that? Literally the only thing most people would talk to us about was being married, having kids, and being married with kids. No one asked me what I did anymore. They asked me what my husband did. Story 5. There's also the question of whether or not it's worth the time and energy to argue about mundane things, like how the towels are folded. I get that a lot of couples have issues over household chores, but in my mind, the fact that the chores are getting done, perhaps not to my specifications, but completed, means a lot. Managing your emotions is a good way to put it. For me, fighting is unpleasant and brings me down in a way few other things do. It's exhausting, and not something I want to spend time doing, especially when I'm with those I supposedly love. It's just a bad way to treat people. I mention liking your spouse because it seems as though a lot of people don't. If you like someone, why would you fight with them over dumb stuff? Story 6. By tolerating an unfair relationship with your spouse, you're setting that as an example for your kids. We held on to our marriage for too long because of the kids, but then the kids watched the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, and the poor relationship and normalize it. So many peers I've spoken to speak happily of the divorce their parents had because it meant the parents stopped fighting and stonewalling each other. My parents never divorced, but because my parents never separated, I thought that that was what good parents should do. Anyways, I separated, and my three kids, eight, six, and four-year-old boys, are all much happier. I realize I hadn't felt like myself in years. I strongly urge you to reconsider. You don't deserve that kind of disrespect, and you're essentially teaching your children that it's okay to be treated like that. Story 7. Saying, let me ask my wife, doesn't mean I'm asking permission. We're a team. We make decisions together. Also, if it's about going to or doing something, I'm really forgetful and want to make sure we haven't already made plans. Ugh, my family does not get this. When my family asks me or us to do something, I'll often say, let me ask my husband. They read it as me asking his permission, which is 100% not the case. I'm my own person and do what I want, but it is because I don't always know what he has going on and he's the point person on some of the kids' activities. So I want to ask him to be sure there's not a conflict, not because I need his permission to do anything. To me, it's common courtesy. To them, it's me deferring to my husband. Been married about 20 years and they still don't get it. Frustrating. Story 8. This happened with my husband and his best friend, My husband kind of put him in his place at one point, and he backed off. Then he got married, and he came back to my husband and apologized and said he understood now. Same thing happened when they had a baby. We had a baby, like, way before any of our friends, and they just didn't get it. Once my husband's best friend and his wife had their son, he told us he didn't realize how hard it was and how much we actually did as friends because it's a huge sacrifice to continue to be active in a friend group when you have a super freaking fussy baby. Both of those admissions and apologies have been incredibly validating and healing for my husband and me. We knew that our friends didn't understand, and so we never were upset with them, but it has been nice for them to see things from our perspective. Story 9. Marriage and long-term relationships in general are a lot less work if done with the right person. It seems obvious, but looking through a lot of these comments, I'm seeing disasters of relationships, leading to the idea that marriage is a ton of work, or that fights and insults are just something to be expected, or that you have to have a plan for therapy and constant apologies and reconciliation. My wife and I have none of this in our marriage. We're compatible. We enjoy each other's company, respect each other's boundaries, and get along easily. It seems to me that the tricky part is finding the right person, so that you don't end up with the tricky part of averting divorce and disaster while married to the wrong person. I don't know that there are any magic bullets to that trick, but I can tell you that issues like sitting down with a marriage counselor or learning how to reconcile after a screaming match don't have to be part of navigating a marriage if you're not that incompatible to begin with. 
Story 10. Spending time with my wife is neither a burden or a chore. She was my best friend before we even started dating. Of course I enjoy hanging out with her. My fiancé and I both work from home, and it's my favorite thing. I love cooking, and my job is very flexible, so I make us fun lunches, and we take midday walks on a nearby trail most days. We were friends for over 15 years before getting together in our mid-30s. Now he's truly my best friend and the person I enjoy spending time with the most. I just don't understand people who don't actually like their partner. Story 11. Life is hard. A marriage is the ultimate partnership. No matter what happens, I have her back. No matter what happens, she has my back. Only enter a marriage if you truly support your partner for better or worse. Furthermore, you are going to experience some of the or worse. A good marriage is when both partners can take on an or worse situation, support each other, and come out okay. I've been with my wife for 13 years. It's not all sunshine and roses. We stay together because of honest conversations, even the really hard conversations. You have to have those long talks in which you get to the core beliefs, not surface talks. Once you have a framework of core values, then you and your partner can actually make real decisions. Story 12. This is a magic phrase. Will you forgive me for blank? My husband and I commonly use it for when we get irritated and snap at each other, but it works for most things. It's an apology and an acknowledgement of what you did wrong all at once, and it's asking for forgiveness rather than expecting it with an I'm sorry. Partners are going to disagree, have bad days, all of that. If you stop feeling like a team, those things add up and turn into me versus you. So try to assume the best. If your spouse does something really annoying, maybe it's because they weren't thinking, rather than maliciously trying to make your life harder. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Story 13. My parents have had separate bedrooms for about 12 years now. They have completely different sleeping schedules, interests in shows, as well as sleeping habits. My mom and I sleep in the dark, my dad with the lights on. Plus, my dad snores pretty loudly. They talk in the morning, in the afternoon, on weekends, whenever they want to. Some days they talk to each other for hours. Others, they don't. The healthiest marriage in all my immediate and extended family. Story 14. My girlfriend's slightly overbearing dad was in town, so we were spending some time with him. I came midway into a conversation where he was strongly encouraging her to go to a chiropractor for some minor back pain. For context, I think chiropractic is mostly BS. She looked at me and asked what I thought about it. I just said, I haven't really spent much time looking into it. What do you think about it? Which totally empowered her. Instead of just listening to the dudes in her life about how to live it, I tried to turn it around and make it clear her opinion was the one that mattered in that moment which she told me later she appreciated. Story 15. For the love of God, don't go crazy with how much you spend on the wedding day. It's one day, and it's over in a flash. Try to keep costs down as much as you can. That money you saved can go towards a house, or into savings for when you'll truly need it. Also, the whole don't go to bed mad thing is absolutely BS. Go to bed mad. When you have both slept on it, you may see things in a different light, and tensions have calmed. Happy wife, happy life is toxic to a marriage as well. You should be concerned with each other's happiness equally. It's a partnership. Story 16. I'm the person who gets mad and then steps back to figure out why I'm mad. I get ticked off at my husband multiple times a day, but he never notices it because they are stupid reasons to be mad. It's me being angry that he didn't put something back where I think it should go. Is that a reason to fight? Well, if you leave milk on the counter constantly, then maybe. Definitely never the case with us. But putting the mayonnaise on the shelf instead of the door in the fridge is not a reason to fight. It's back in the fridge. Where it's located isn't wrong because it's still where it needs to be. You can calm down and then talk about it without it turning into a fight. Story 17. I've always thought marriage adds extra pressure in the legal confirmation of you being together and the vows you make to one another. Children just add an extra layer of pressure where you have less time to devote to one another, so any cracks that were in the relationship before 
will get blown into massive fissures, which can be fixed. However, if the relationship needed saving before the kids, it is not going to last when the kids come along, I don't think. Story 18. I left her a month before our wedding. I lost tens of thousands of dollars with her, maybe even six figures if you add it all up. The thing I learned the most is that only you can save you from a bad relationship. Absolutely nobody else is going to show up and do it for you. I don't have dependents, but if I did, I honestly believe sticking in a miserable existence for them is still no way to live. This stress alone must be crippling. My old relationship I was on prescription muscle relaxers for tension headaches. Stress kills. Story 19. Pretty well written. My wife and I had minor problems that could all be managed by just chatting and hanging out together. We made each other happy enough just by being together that the minor stuff wouldn't even be an issue. So when we had a kid, which has been largely awesome, and our time together got turned into time for our daughter, we started to fight a lot more. Make time for mom and dad dates without the kids, for the good of you both. You need some time to just hang out and love each other. Story 20. This was what I wanted to say. The problems that existed before getting married will be there after the reception. Marriage doesn't and shouldn't change anything about your relationship. I had a friend whose life goal at 14 was grow up, get married, and have babies. That never changed. So she grew up, got engaged to the first guy that she could browbeat into proposing to, and was married less than two years after meeting him. I visited a few days after the wedding and jokingly asked her how was married life, and I'll never forget the confusion in her voice when she answered, It's just like living together. I thought something would be different. Story 21. Common values matter way more than common interests. Relationship where my girlfriend and I liked all the same stuff, didn't have the same values, fought constantly. Relationship where my girlfriend and I liked none of the same stuff, had 90% similar values, best conversations ever, showed each other cool stuff, found new amazing things neither of us would have thought of alone. Story 22. Compromise is not a sign of weakness. It is done out of respect for your spouse. Also, not everything requires compromise. Sometimes the answer is, you both do your own thing separately. Think about the impact a decision has on you and your partner before going immediately into negotiations. Story 23. A gracious, heartfelt apology goes a long way. Adding on to this, make sure to be accepting of heartfelt apologies as well. Grudges are never good in relationships. Learn to forgive your partner, especially when they've gone to the effort of apologizing and trying to be better. Story 24. You don't have to argue or fight. You're different people and it's okay to not agree on everything. It would be weird if you did. I see a lot of people fighting because they're always trying to get the other person to come around to their point of view. Accept that you're different and have fun together. In addition to loving each other, you should like each other. Story 25. Getting married is easy. Staying married is hard. Get help if things seem too hard. My wife and I both carried a lot of childhood trauma into our marriage. A counselor helped us both understand that and gave us tools to handle it. We would have divorced without the help. Story 26. It's okay for your relationship to look the way you want it to. Don't worry about stereotypes or society standards. If you enjoy separate hobbies, great. If you want to play video games together well into your 40s, go for it. As long as you're not being abusive towards one another, I really do think there's no right or wrong way to do marriage. It took me a few years to realize I didn't need to fit some wife mold due to the way I was raised, and I'm so much happier now that we live exactly the way we want to. Story 27. During a relationship, you will face devastating emotional events. Death of parents is an example that will test the limits of your bond. If you married anyone less than your best friend, your relationship will not survive. The divorce rate of partners who've lost children is almost 67%. My wife and I have lost our son and both sets of parents during our 38 years of marriage, and we wouldn't have survived if not for the fact that we are best friends who are emotionally bonded beyond the bedroom. Story 28. Babies don't fix relationships. If you were struggling before, then a baby is going to make those struggles even harder. 
babies make fantastic relationships harder. Don't have a baby if you're having problems. Don't have a baby to fix things. Don't have a baby to try to keep your spouse from leaving. It won't work. Story 29. I wish my wife liked her own space in bed. I woke up the other night and she was sleeping on top of me. Literally no part of her body was on the mattress. It was all on me. I had to yeet her across the bed just so I could breathe. Story 30. Divorce is awful and terrible and painful. Before you enter into marriage, realize that the only way out, except death I guess, is a very painful, public, and traumatizing experience. If you don't truly believe you can make it work for the rest of your life, don't do it unless you can handle the train wreck that is divorce. Story 31. It's okay to use two blankets. No one likes to wake up with cold butt cheeks because your spouse stole the blanket. Story 32. Your single problems will be your married problems. Marriage and your spouse can't fix you. Work on yourself as much as you can before you get married. For yourself and for your spouse. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.